All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for attending today. Uh, my name is James Taylor. I'm the CEO of Gaslight. And uh, this is our Tech Cafeteria series. We do this once a month, um, at the beginning of every month on the first Wednesday. Uh, today, the topic uh, brings a little bit different group than what we usually see. Usually, these are a little bit more tech focused. Uh, I guess thinking suspicion that the people in the room are much more just avid soccer fans, regardless of what industry you might be working in. So, uh, I will say just a quick uh, promo for Gaslight. Um, we are a custom software development shop. Um, we do everything from kind of enterprise type work that businesses might use to um, you know, website development and things of that nature. Um, I will also say we are, we are currently looking to expand our team, hiring both developers and designers. So if you know anybody you think might be interested, we'd love for you to pass on their contact information uh, before you leave today. We'd appreciate it. So uh, without any further ado, I'll go ahead and bring uh, Jeff Birding up to talk about FC Cincinnati. Um, I will quickly say that I am personally very excited to have FC Cincinnati here. I grew up as a soccer player. Um, I'm dating myself a little bit, but I re remember as a kid uh, a Cincinnati Cheetahs team. Uh, I remember the Silverbacks. Um, I remember the River Hawks, and finally for one of these teams to stick and get the enthusiasm and excitement that the city has behind them is really, is really just great to see. We've needed this for a long time, and it's great it's finally happening. So, like I said, without any further ado, Jeff Birding. Thank you very much, James. I, I think you didn't date yourself at all, because I, I think you get out there with our players and still play today. So. I don't know how long ago that was, but uh, I'm thrilled to be here today. I have a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation, sort of walks through the creation of uh, FC Cincinnati and, and uh, why we believed we uh, would be successful. Uh, a little bit about myself, uh, I spent 19 years as an executive at the Cincinnati Bengals, where I oversaw all of our sales and public affairs efforts. Uh, during my 19 years at the Bengals, I spent almost six years on Cincinnati City Council as an elected member from 2005 until 2011. So while I was at the Bengals in the sports world, I tried to be pretty civically engaged. I was a 10-year volunteer at the United Way and uh, at the Chamber of Commerce uh, and some uh, other not-for-profits in the, in the uh, city. Uh, ultimately, after I left city council, I became president of my uh, children's youth club, Hammer FC. We merged with uh, Kings to become the second biggest uh, youth club in town. You know, sort of during that time that I was introduced to the business of, uh, of soccer. So to start with uh, the, the, the premise, uh, we felt that uh, Cincinnati has long been a major league sports town. You know, we're the home of the, of the oldest professional baseball team in the world. Uh, the, the Bengals and the NFL were, were started by Paul Brown, who's considered one of literally the inventors of the modern NFL, the modern uh, pro football game. Uh, we have a strong history here of supporting our college teams. And so this is a big league sports town. And we felt like if we did soccer at a big league sports level, uh, we would have uh, every opportunity to be uh, successful. Uh, and we, and we, th we think we proved that. Good morning, everyone. And a big special Cincinnati welcome to our new friends from the United Soccer League. The recent All-Star Game hosted here in Cincinnati reinforced what we already knew, that we are a big league sports town. It's exciting to stand here today to add yet another team to our city's roster. Please welcome Jeff Birding, the new president and general manager. One of the biggest youth soccer communities in the entire United States, you now have a pro team. Because I believe it would be smart to believe in soccer and to believe in Cincinnati, FC Cincinnati, starting today. You know, what kind of players do we want to wear the jersey, to wear the crests on their heart? Humble, hungry, um, soccer intelligent, good characteristics on and off the field. All the vets right here today, so I'm very, very excited. Starting something from the ground up, um, and then just the support for the club. Uh, everybody seems to be doing things the right way. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're spending money revamping the stadium. It is a crisp April evening as the lads take the pitch for the first time a professional soccer match we played here on the campus of the University of Cincinnati. Going over to a goalie, look into scissor kick it, and there it is! The first ever goal at Nippert Stadium as 
the fans, uh, the supporters, uh, the families that are here. I mean, it, I think it's it, it clearly shows that Cincinnati is easily ready, you know, for for this market for soccer. I mean, it's it's such a huge positive, you know, the, the numbers that turned out tonight, and uh, they they make a big difference. So I hope we're able to sustain it to keep it going. But what a, what a fantastic night! Breaking record like that is incredible, and to do it at so early as a brand new club. I don't even know how to respond to it. It's such a great situation. So I'm going to begin with the belief why we thought uh, this had an opportunity to be successful, uh, our business proposition. Uh, when we did the, some research, we saw that uh, in the 18 to 35 age group, Soccer was one of their most uh, favorite sports, if not number one, number two behind uh, pro and college football. Uh, in the MLS in uh, 2014, they were averaging uh, over 22,000 fans a game, uh, and that was continuing to grow. In the 2015 season, they brought on New, New York City FC and Orlando City, both averaging over 30,000 fans a game. Uh, Orlando City came from the USL, which is, I'll talk about the league we're in, uh, and after several years of success, they earned the right to go uh, up into MLS. Um, over 100,000 fans attending international friendlies at the Michigan and uh, in Ann Arbor and at the Rose Bowl, over 90,000. So you were seeing these enormous crowds uh, here in the US. Uh, in the MLS, building new soccer-specific stadiums. So clearly, business people, smart business people, successful business people, feeling it's worthwhile to invest 100, 150, 250 million dollars in soccer-specific stadiums. Uh, obviously, the diversity of, of the sport. You know, many women grow up, girls grow up playing soccer. That's an advantage over baseball, an advantage over football. And so you have a passion among female fans, and you see that in the demographic in the MLS. Uh, as Don Garber, the MLS commissioner, said, uh, soccer is a sport for a new, our, our new country, for a new century, because it, changes the, cha it reflects the changing nature of our society, younger, more international, uh, more Hispanic, uh, more in tune to the rest of the world. Uh, and so we thought that uh, it represented the future of the United States. We thought that there would be a big competition for cities. And at a certain point, the cities, the league, MLS, would tap out. And it was critical for us to get in when we did, because at a certain point, there'd be cities that had franchises, and other cities were, wouldn't. And they'd all be wondering, why were we standing on the sidelines not paying attention when this happened? Because all these cities that have soccer teams seem to be having a lot of fun with it. Uh, so we decided we would make a bet on soccer. So why soccer? Well, talk about both in our city and the world. Over 56,000 youth soccer players in the greater Cincinnati region. Uh, it's one of the top uh, five per capita in the United States. Uh, so clearly a very rich youth soccer uh, history, a youth soccer culture uh, here in Cincinnati that's now into its third generation of players. Uh, obviously, Cincinnati is becoming more international. I don't think any of us would call Cincinnati, you know, an enormously international city, but we're growing. It's an important initiative of our mayor. Uh, it's an important initiative of the University of Cincinnati and our universities to draw more international uh, students uh, and workers into our city. So becoming younger, becoming more international, soccer is their sport. You can see here in terms of the rest of the world, soccer is the world's most popular sport. More people are playing soccer on this planet than every other sport combined. Uh, part of that is the history of the British Empire. Part of it is because the low barrier to play. You know, you can make a ball out of most anything. You can be in an alleyway. You can be in a street. You can create a couple things to make goals. And all of a sudden, you're moving the ball uh, with your feet. Uh, you see the number of people watching the World Cup and the passion that people have uh, for their countries and for their clubs uh, in the sport of soccer. And then here you see a couple statistics in the US, 12 to 24, uh, you can see the number for soccer, and among Hispanics, it's far and away number one. So I mentioned I was at the Bengals for 19 years, and every year at the beginning of the season, the NFL would uh, share with us what was called the sponsorship deck, and it would, it would show the power of the NFL. And we'd share that with our local advertisers, our local sponsors, our local broadcast partners, and the NFL would do that on a national level. 
And obviously it does show that the NFL is king. But if you pay, were paying attention, and when I started being the president of my kids' youth soccer team, I started paying attention, what you can see is, is the growth of soccer over the last 10 years. Uh, so this is the ESPN sports poll. They would ask 1,000 people 12 and older in the US, what's your favorite sport? And you can see the NFL there is number one, MLB number two, college football, and then pro soccer ahead of the NBA, college basketball, NHL, and NASCAR, right? 10 years ago, soccer was not on this chart. Women's figure skating was on the chart. <laughs> Soccer, the world's most popular sport, was not on the chart in the United States. And then 10 years ago, it came in at the bottom, and it sort of hovered down there at the bottom. And then in the last five years, a rocket shot. And that rocket shot happened to be when I was the president of my kid's team and started paying attention a little bit. I went back to see if it was a little bit of a trend line, and it, it sure was. Uh, obviously, this is 12 and older. So this includes my father's generation. He's 73. He grew up on baseball. I'm 49. We grew up on football. I have three teenage kids. They're growing up on soccer. So when you look at this next slide, by the way, this is, ex this is the exact slide that I, other than the little subhead uh, that I brought with me from the NFL. So is this next one. So this is the slide that shows Nielsen ratings, OK? 18 to 49, the sweet spot for advertisers. People that don't have brand identity yet, uh, 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 brand affinity yet necessarily, or they're just starting out, as well as the people making consumer buying decisions at the home. So 18 to 49, my, ja my dad's generation that grew up on baseball is out, right? So here you go. What sports are people watching on TV in the United States who are 18 to 49? Well, there's the NFL. They, they want everyone to see that. And there's college football, but there's soccer, number three, ahead of NBA, ahead of college basketball. You can see the precipitous drop by, of MLB. Uh, and then you see NASCAR's way down, golf, NHL, tennis. Again, 10 years ago, soccer was not on this chart. OK? And so all of a sudden, you see this, and you start to think, there's something happening in our country with soccer. And I'm traveling to all these tournaments, Disney, Charlotte. My son's team was pretty good, winning state cups, playing the US National League. You're seeing thousands of teams, families, all the hotel rooms booked. My son plays in uh, Elizabethtown, which is about 50 minutes south of Louisville. And we have a hotel room in Louisville at the airport because every hotel is booked. So clearly, people were spending money. You were seeing it. We just didn't have a sports team. So then the question was, why don't we have a pro soccer team in Cincinnati? And it is, uh, was referenced, it's been tried before, but it failed. So then I started asking myself, well, what are some of the propositions that you would need to do a soccer startup and make a soccer franchise successful? Well, number one, you need strong ownership, uh, just like any startup. If you're looking at how can I maximize in the short term my ROI on my investment, a sports franchise is not it. Most sports fr franchises are not successful, are not uh, profitable initially. Most startups aren't necessarily profitable initially. So do you have the ownership that's willing to say, we're gonna, we're gonna bet on this over the long term and we're gonna be patient and we're gonna let this grow and we're gonna support it and see where we can take it. No other sports franchise, soccer sports franchise, had had that uh, yet. Need a top venue for games. I say respectfully, it's hard to call yourself a pro sports team if you're playing in a high school stadium. It just, it, it doesn't fit. It doesn't sit right with the consumer uh, in terms of th this is pro, but I'm in high school. Uh, so others had not yet figured out the venue. Uh, you need experienced sports management. Uh, again, respectfully, some of the people that have tried before, you know, a lot of them were soccer enthusiasts, were passionate about soccer, but they didn't necessarily have the business background uh, in terms of be it the Reds, the Bengals, uh, and some of the other folks we have involved. Uh, and then you need a top level professional league. I, 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 you know, I mentioned I've seen a lot of youth soccer. When it's kids all sort of in clusters following the ball around the field, that's not exactly the beautiful game. We love our kids, we smile, we laugh, 
but we felt it was critical that if we were going to introduce professional soccer to this city, it needed to be soccer that when people came to the games, watched it, would say, yeah, that's pretty good. You know, it's not the Premier League, it's not the World Cup, but it, it, it looks like high-level soccer. Uh, so our goal was to show that the Cincinnati market would support Major League Soccer. Again, we're a Major League sports town. That's what separates us from nice cities like uh, Lexington and Louisville and, and Toledo, you know, that have minor league sports teams as a part of their experience. We have pro sports teams as a part of our experience here. So to get there, we had to show that the Cincinnati market can support Major League Soccer, and part of that was to do the things above and then see if we could draw 10,000 a game on average. So here's our ownership uh, answering those, uh, those needs. Carl Linder III and his family uh, are our majority owners. The minority owners include uh, Scott Farmer from Cintas, uh, George Joseph from the Joseph Auto Group, uh, Jack Wyant, uh, Steve Hightower is the largest minority business owner in Cincinnati, greater Cincinnati. Uh, I'm in the ownership group. And then uh, I had the benefit, the first person I hired to help me put this together was Mark McCullers. Mark was for 10 years the uh, president and GM of the Columbus Crew. And when Lamar Hunt sold the crew, the new owner brought in his own president and GM. He set up his, his uh, consulting shingle, and I figured I knew a lot about the business of sport. I didn't necessarily know a lot about the business of soccer. Uh, and so Mark was the one that I brought on first to engage UC uh, and negotiate a lease with the University of Cincinnati, and he stayed on as my owner representative uh, since. So here's our, we, so we solved the ownership. Here's the uh, facility, uh, Nippert Stadium. UC had just put in $90 million, uh, creating uh, all the things that a pro soccer team or a college football team for that matter needs. Suites, club seats, sponsorships, different seating areas, uh, locker rooms, weight rooms, all the training facilities that a team would need. Uh, and uh, give us the opportunity to put in an all green pitch so it looks authentically soccer. Uh, and then as you may have seen, if you saw the news last week, when UC had the football games out there, uh, the end zones and the center logo literally roll out and they roll in the UC marks for their end zones and it looks like a, a football field. So people ask, um, you know, why did uh, President Onono, the Board of Trustees, why did they do this? There's not a lot of college football, college, uh, colleges doing these pro soccer partnerships. So what did, they, what did they see that everyone else wasn't seeing? And I give them credit. So you have over 40,000 students on campus, as I showed in the earlier slide. A lot of college students really love soccer. There's a real passion for soccer. They've played it. They've been around it. It's, there's a worldview there. Uh, and we've pretty much fall between the end of March Madness and the start of the college football season, so something to do on campus. Uh, they have their uh, highest international uh, percentage of students on campus. They're continuing to want to recruit and draw more. What a better way to integrate if you're from a foreign country to come to the University of Cincinnati. Right on campus there's a pro soccer team that your fellow students love and is a big part of your culture and your history. I mentioned those 56,000 youth soccer players. Well, guess what? Those are future applicants to the University of Cincinnati. Many of them never been on campus, haven't seen the tens of millions of dollars of investment on UC's campus, and they're walking around going, well, it's pretty. There, there's a campus here. It, it, maybe it defies a little bit of the stereotypes that some people have thought about the University of Cincinnati. Our games are all on television, so it's a showcase in the region uh, for UC. And then again, it has everything that we need as a pro soccer team. So this is just an example. This is the visiting uh, football locker room underneath the Bailey, underneath the north end zone. So we've completely transformed that uh, with support of UC to make this our locker room. So if for football, there's additional lockers that are put down the middle that are football lockers, our guys can lock things in the bottom with the safe. Um, but this is our locker room. So when the visiting football team comes, they're in the FC Cincinnati locker room. On the other side, we have a club room, which is team meetings, video, and the like. UC only uses that as their locker room for game days, so we transition that between UC football and FC soccer uh, around their football schedule. So I talked about management. We then went out and hired a coach, and not just any coach, but maybe the most prolific US men's soccer player.
Marks on the right. That's a good effort. Oh, what a tremendous goal by John Hart. So we felt if we were going to be a club that sort of looked like a pro team, uh, having a big name coach uh, certainly gave us credibility. Not just as it relates to this market uh, and the national soccer media, but also we were recruiting 25 players from scratch. And so having John Harks call them, call their agent, hey, we're trying this, we're starting up a new club in Cincinnati. It's owned by Carl Lindner, family stone the Reds. It's being run by a guy who was at the Bengals for 19 years. You know, that was a good recruiting pitch. Uh, and um, I think from our standpoint, what I told John when you know, we interviewed the other co candidates, there was a style of play that we wanted to play. So I, I think all of us would agree that when you think of the Pittsburgh Steelers, as much as we dislike them, they do have a brand identity. You sort of know what you're getting when you play the Steelers. It doesn't matter if they're playing a 3-4 or a 4-3, the formation, it doesn't matter, but there's a culture, there's a, an identity of how they're going to play, strong, tough, physical, nasty maybe, cheating maybe, but you know, that's what they're going to do. And so what I told John is, I don't care if you want to play a 4-4-2 you know, or 4-3-3, but we're, we're going to play a possession attacking style, an entertaining style of soccer. I want our fans, when they see it, to go you know, that's entertaining, it's pretty, it creates chances. I didn't want to win a bunch of games 1-0. I, I was willing to lose some games 3-2 because I want to make sure we're entertaining. I wanted that to be a part of our brand identity and John was uh, on board and I would say I think we've delivered that. A Little bit about our league. Our league at the USL is 29 teams uh, in the east or the west, we're in the east. Um, it's made up of three different groups. Uh, 11 teams are what we would refer to, I think, in vernacular as AAA teams to an MLS squad. They are referred to in soccer as the twos. LA Galaxy 2, uh, Orlando City 2, New York Red Bulls 2. And they literally, they're, they're not trying to sell 5,000, 10,000 tickets. They're trying to develop soccer players. And when they dress 18 for a game, the seven guys that don't dress can slide down and play in our games. Uh, it's a real advantage uh, for them, as you, as you would expect. Um, that's 11 of the 20 have a two. Um, and then there's a, about, of the 18 independents, about half the teams, we would consider minor league markets. Rochester, Charleston, Wilmington. Uh, you know, they're, they're markets that literally, they have minor league baseball teams. They have a minor league experience. And then there's a handful of teams that we would consider big league markets, major league markets. They have in, pro teams in the other big sports, be it Charlotte uh, or Sacramento or OKC or uh, Oklahoma City, San Antonio, St. Louis and Pittsburgh, of course, uh, and Cincinnati. And to varying degrees, we are competing with those big league markets to be selected as the next group to move up into MLS in the next round of expansion. So I'll briefly go through a little bit of the soccer side. Uh, like, like every other business, startup uh, or mature company, you project your revenues and then you project what your expenses can be against revenues uh, with the thought either of, of making money, breaking even, or having sustainable losses that your ownership will endorse. Because we're playing at Nippert, because we thought we might be able to sell 10,000 tickets, we have a little bit more revenue than a lot of the teams in our league. And so we were able, there's no salary cap, to build a roster that we thought could compete for a league championship in year one, and that was the goal. Uh, this market was hun is hungry for postseason success, and we felt like if we could be a winning team <laughs> right out of the gate, that would give us a chance to capture the attention and the embrace uh, of the market. So we have 25 players, a mix. We have 11 guys that played in the MLS. Uh, some of our top paid guys would be comparable to some of the lower paid guys in MLS. Uh, so, or some of the guys played in MLS, but then maybe they got moved down into our league and then we signed them over and the teams released their rights, relinquished their rights to them. But 11 guys with MLS history, USL, our league, NASL veterans, NASL is like a sister league. Um, uh, we're allowed up to seven international players uh, and uh, it being the world sport, that's no surprise that we did recruiting there. 
Uh, and then we have a handful of guys that literally last fall, a year ago, were playing on college campuses here in the US. Uh, we had open tryouts uh, in November. Two players literally made it from an open tryout. You paid 100 bucks, you got to try out. Uh, and um, then we had an invitation-only combine in January, and six players made it there. A lot of those were the college guys who in the fall were you know, on their campuses, and we were scouting them. Uh, so our schedule, uh, we started the preseason in February. We went down to Florida and won the IMG Sun Classic. We beat New York City FC uh, and two uh, international teams to win that. Uh, we had some friendlies up here in March. Our inaugural match was in April. The US Open Cup in May. We played Crystal Palace, our international friendly, which we'll do every year in July. Uh, the end of the regular season's uh, coming up. We have four more games, only one at home on the 17th. Uh, then in October, the playoffs, the higher seed will host every round, including the league championship game. Uh, so we would have the potential to have four home playoff games. I think in all likelihood, really it'd be three because I assume the league championship, unless someone goes and no knocks off Red Bulls too, uh, that's where the uh, Eastern Conference Finals would be. 15 uh, matches at home, 15 away. Next year, that'll go to 32, 16, and 16. And we've tried to schedule mostly on Saturdays. So this is uh, the $10,000 uh, that we got from uh, winning the IMG Sun Classic. That was down in Florida. I like to joke that by the time the coaches made it back to Ohio, they had spent the 10,000 three times over. <laughs> Ping pong table in the locker room, less bus trips, you know, more travel gear. Uh, so how are we doing? We have over 6,000 season tickets. We already have 400 new deposits for 2017. On average, that would be about three more, three tickets per account, so maybe another 1,200. Our goal is to get to 10,000. We've set the USL attendance record twice, 20,000 and then 23. Uh, 35,000 for Crystal Palace at the time, the highest sporting, uh, highest attended soccer event in Ohio. Um, we set the league attendance record, so for all of the USL, 15 matches, we set the league season attendance record after 10 matches. Uh, so we, we will be up over 250,000 by the time the season's over. I think the pre previous record was like 153, 153,000. Uh, and then you can see we really worked hard to get some of the top brands on board. We thought this was critical to MLS and to our credibility in the market. So, you know, to use Kroger as an example. Kroger, we need you on board. Let's find a partnership. Let's find a level of spending and investment level that fits you but we need to have Kroger's logo up on this slide. And so we worked really closely with a lot of the top companies in town and are always looking for additional ones. And so another big part has just been uh, FC in the community. Obviously, I think that's a big part of what fans expect. You know, you give your passion, you give your time, you give your money to support a team. You want to know that the team's giving back. I always said at the Bengals, the Bengals give back, just no one knows about it because the Bengals organization feels that's not the reason you do good things. You do good things because it's the right thing to do. And I always said, I'm not asking us to put it out there for us. I'm asking us to put it out there for the fans. The fans need to know. And so we've been engaged in the community and we've tried to get it out there a little bit, uh, being working with the youth clubs, our give back program. We give 20% of the money back to the not-for-profits that uh, support us through tickets. Uh, signing autographs after the match, engaging the fans. Uh, in my mind, this is all a part of brand building and a part of showing that you know it's a, it's a two-way street. It's not just a one-way street. Another part of our success, we've really, really tried to keep the ticket prices low. You know, we're in a 35,000 seat venue. We have a lot of tickets to sell. Uh, so we tarped off the upper level uh, with the exception of Palace uh, to try to create a more intimate feel, make sure it looked more like an FC Cincinnati venue instead of you know, a UC football venue, uh, and then tried to concentrate the areas with prices that range really in the you know, $20, $25 for lower midfield, around $35 up in the club. Uh, the Bailey, I think, is eight. The youth area is 10. And then this student section uh, is a $5 ticket. And so the goal is there's price points that make us very uh, attainable for all families in the region. And, and we've tried to create a game experience working with our supporters groups that are in the Bailey to make it fun. And I, it's one of the things we're most proud of is I have a lot of older you know, business friends that aren't soccer, 
but they've come to the matches and they're just blown away by how much fun they have. And they're like, we're still trying to figure out offsides. But, <laughs> but we have a great time. We're having a great time. Uh, and we've had a lot of feedback from families, you know, e economic times that we're in, there's a lot of stress out there on families. And we want to be uh, something with the barriers so low that families can come and we're a very affordable opportunity for people to come and have a good time together uh, as a family. I mentioned part of uh, pro sports is premium seating. You got to have premium seating opportunities. You got to be able to engage the business community. Uh, and those are key revenue dollars uh, that a sports team needs. And we have those venues at Nippert. So this is what 23,000 uh, people look like. Uh, this was our orange out with the Bengals uh, against Pittsburgh, and uh, obviously it was uh, tremendously successful. I said to the team in the locker room before the game, said that there's going to be a headline in the paper tomorrow. And I said it's going to be one of two things. It's going to be um, Cincinnati figures a way to lose to Pittsburgh in front of a record crowd, <laughs> or it's going to be we finally have a team that can beat Pittsburgh in front of a record crowd. It's going to be one of those two. And if you really want to win this market over, we need to be the team that beats Pittsburgh. Uh, and uh, obviously, there was a, a great feeling in that stadium uh, after that match. Uh, so we, we felt that was an important part of capturing the attention of the market. Uh, just a couple quick things. All of our games are on TV. And I, and I want to uh, make a light of this. Uh, this was a very tough deal for, for us. Uh, this isn't the NFL, where I think the Bengals, uh, in, in the NFL, according to the Green Bay Packers, uh, things that they release publicly, since they're a publicly owned uh, team, I think they get about $200 million a year in TV, national TV revenue, right? That's separate from their preseason deal with local revenue. We're paying to be on TV. So we produce the game, I buy the airtime, I rent the truck, I pay the talent, the whole thing. And then we try to sell the advertising to make a little bit of it back. Uh, but we're, we're getting really good ratings, and I think part of the ratings has supported ticket sales. People are checking out the game, hey, the cocktail talk, water cooler, then they check it out on TV, it seems like it's fun, it's pretty good quality, let's go to the game. So I think that's been a part of it. It's also been a part of credibility in the market. Uh, we get a lot of news coverage from all the TV stations, not just Local 12, and I think a part of that is because we're a big league uh, sports team. Well, what defines a big league sports team? Well, I, I think in this market, and probably in most markets, being on TV is sort of, you know, that, um, that question mark, that um, crucible of credibility. And so when I went to Carl Linder and said, I, I want to do a TV deal and this is what it's going to look like, we put an RFP, we couldn't get any takers at a better deal than this. And uh, I said, here's why it's important. Think of the biggest sports teams in this town that have the biggest fan allegiance. Xavier basketball on TV. UC basketball and uh, football, they're on TV. Of course, the Reds and the Bengals, they're on TV. The Cyclones, they're not on TV. Do you want us to have people think of us as that group, the first group, or like the Cyclones? Because if, if we're like the Cyclones, people will treat us. We won't be on the news, on the sports. We won't be talked about. Uh, you know, we'll get the attendance, respectfully, of the Cyclones. Uh, but, or we can put ourselves up there, and it's going to cost us. And it was a big six-figure loss, but I considered it a critical part of investing in the franchise. If you don't have the ownership, a Cyclones guy was in the uh, audience one of the times, and he came up to me and said, I wish I would have thought of that. And I said, you did think of it. You just didn't have the ownership. Because if you don't have an ownership willing to lose six figures on a TV deal, you're not going to do it. But we felt it was, uh, it was critical to us. Uh, obviously, we've not only captured the attention in Cincinnati, but we've captured the attention really not only in the U.S., uh, but across the world. So, um, you know, this is the front page of uh, ESPN uh, when we did the Orange Out. These are some of the biggest soccer folks uh, in the market. Uh, here's some international. We've been on the BBC several times. FIFA has a television show that they put on that would be like an E60 where you have segments. FIFA, FIFA Soccer, which is worldwide broadcast, did a segment on FC Cincinnati. They came in for the Crystal Palace match. Uh, this is the MLS Reddit page, shows attendance, and you can see here's FC Cincinnati, just under 17,000 a game, ahead of five MLS teams, and, including the Columbus Crew. Um, so, 
And I, I only cite the crew because, you know, they're Midwest. They're obviously up the road. And so they are a good comparison point uh, for us. So this is, uh, I'm going to end on Crystal Palace. This is obviously a big highlight of the year. Uh, we had 35,000 people at Nippert for a soccer game. If you would have said, you know, when we launched this last August that we were going to do that, uh, and, I, in, and I knew we were going to be successful. I left the Bengals knowing we would be successful with this. I never saw that. Uh, my daughter, I have a high school age daughter, right before the game, we're sitting up in my suite, I'm entertaining some folks, and she looks out over this and says, look what you did. Like, it's awesome. And it really is, because the beauty of sports, the beauty of it, uh, is, it, it, number one, we live in a pretty divided time. And sports has this unique ability to bring people together. So if I'm at UC, I'm saying, you know, look, the SAEs don't like the betas, but when you're playing Xavier, you all like each other fine for the Crosstown shootout, you know? And in, and in, and in uh, Cincinnati, you know, the UC and Xavier guys may not like each other, but when it's for the Bengals or for the Reds and they're playing in the playoff, you know, we're all together. We're arm in arm. We're hugging strangers and high-fiving. And even the Steelers people will like when we're all rooting for the U.S. women to, you know, win the World Cup or the U.S. men. So sports does bring us together. The other thing is, and Carl Linder reminds me of this all the time, you know, we're not dealing with kids with cancer. Uh, we're not sending people off to war. We're, we're creating entertainment that makes people's lives more fun and more enriching. Uh, and uh, that's such a neat thing to be a part of. Uh, and so to be able to do that and bring the international attention to Cincinnati, because that's the other last part of it with sports, right? You know, there, there is the crawler on ESPN every night and in and, and all the publications where it's Cincinnati. Our name is Cincinnati for a reason. We didn't want to be the Royals. Or we didn't want to be the Lions. We wanted to be Cincinnati, FC Cincinnati, uh, so that we would put our city in the rise of Cincinnati because our timing was perfect. You know, Cincinnati's rising, soccer's rising, and now we're rising together. Alan, a 2-0 victory and two great goals as well. Yeah, but tonight it wasn't about the football really, it was about this club and the way that uh, the whole place was unbelievable tonight. Never experienced anything like it in my life uh, for pre-season, <laughs> like a cup final, and it was uh, brilliant. Uh, yeah, this club is fantastic. Sold out crowd, 35,000 and change here at Nippert Stadium. But it has to be a great thrill just to look out and see oh, it's, the stadium. It's tremendous. In, in uh, obviously, we're so grateful for the embrace of our community. Uh, we said from the very beginning, Cincinnati is a big league sports town, and I think we're showing it tonight. Because we're a very proud city, we get behind our club, FC Cincinnati, and uh, they certainly stood up and you know they applauded everybody, both both teams. I thought it was excellent, excellent. That war, you know, that, uh, that atmosphere, you know, from the from the fans, it was amazing. You know, just to see that in Cincinnati, absolutely great. Taking a shot at Ed Williams with a big save on the legend. Unbelievable. See, and going up against these guys, it just, it's just it's so unbelievable. Dream come true. The love for soccer is in Nippert here tonight. A sellout against an international friendly. Has this exceeded your expectations? FC Cincinnati has taken the city by storm. It is electric here at Nippert. Look at the Bailey. Look at the crowds. I mean, this is a soccer town. I think it's a sport of the future for America. And we've got the Reds and the Bengals, and I think we're going to have FC Cincinnati for a really long time. So I appreciate your interest in FC Cincinnati, and I appreciate the invitation from Gaslight, and if I can answer any questions, I'm happy to try. Hey Jeff, thanks for doing what you do. Uh, I'm serious with this question. What bars are the best supporters before <laughs> and after the game? Because I know you visited, so.
Mm -hmm. Uh, well, the, the post-match Mecklenburg Gardens, it's where Dienerstadt uh, goes, and a lot of the supporters of the opposing team, to the extent we're playing someone within driving distance, uh, will go there and they'll have a beer together. Um, before the match, Mecklenburg Gardens is there. Uh, certainly the Brass Tap, which is just right up there in Clifton, uh, is pretty good. That's where the pride starts. So to the extent that I'm doing my supporter engagement, I'll start. At, at Brass Tap and end at Mecklenburg Gardens. Um, I travel to a lot of the away games, but not all of them, particularly when they're on a trip. And so if I'm gonna go to, uh, to watch the away game, I'll either go to Molly Malone's in Covington or Rhine House. If I have to eat dinner, I'll go to Molly Malone's. If I'm just having a beer, I'll, I'll go to Rhine House. We've got a Baylor season ticket order right here. <laughs> Baylor, 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 it's right, three down for me. Oh yeah, good question. Um, Thanks again uh, for what you do. Absolutely. So excited about having Sonic Thank you. here in Cincinnati. Um, question is, is oh, if you can answer it or not, your lease with the university, mm -hmm. how long is that? And if and when do you guys do mm -hmm. move up into the expansion phase with MLS? We're looking pressure to build a standalone stadium uh, for MC Cincinnati. So our lease with the University of Cincinnati is 15 years. Uh, and um, our goal is to uh, stay there throughout. Uh, the MLS, has com we, we've been engaging them, as you would expect, quietly behind the scenes. Uh, they're gonna, uh, the commissioner and some of his senior staff are going to come to a game, maybe a playoff game this year, but certainly here in the next six months, either beginning of next season or the end of this season, they're going to come in for a game and see Nippert. Uh, you know, Atlanta FC, I was down in Atlanta l uh, last week, uh, they're playing in an NFL stadium. Arthur Blank owns the new Atlanta franchise. He owns the F Falcons. They have a shared stadium. Gillette is owned. Um, is, Gillette is the home of New England Revolution and the Patriots, owned by the Kraft family. Obviously, the um, New York City FC is an expansion team, half owned by the Yankees, playing at Yankee Stadium. And, of course, Seattle Sounders, the, the most successful MLS team, plays where the Seahawks play. So it's not a requirement. Uh, and we're eager to prove that Nippert Stadium can work. Uh, that is our goal. Uh, it's proven. Why mess with success? It's right in the heart of our city, right on a campus of 40,000, other campuses nearby. It's in an eclectic neighborhood. Uh, it's obviously with the rise of OTR and, and uh, development coming up the hill. It's connecting into the downtown. Uh, MLS does like urban locations. Some of the teams in the MLS that are struggling with attendance are not in, an, in an, a dense urban environment, and, and they're struggling a little bit as a result of that. So we're eager to show that it can work. Uh, our lease, to be real candid, you know, if, if, if there would be a condition put to us, and that's a condition that we have to deal with, we have the flexibility to deal with it, but that's certainly not our intention. Yes? We did. We did. So um, uh, Carl Linder's family still has an ownership interest in the Reds. Uh, I've been a Reds season ticket holder since the new stadium opened. Uh, I share it with other, nine other guys. Um, I grew up on the big red machine. So I'm a big, we're, we're, we're Reds fans. We've actually done partnerships with the Reds, including this past weekend, where they had games uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday against St. Louis, and then we played St. Louis, obviously, on Monday. Um, so we're very supportive of the Reds. The economics of Major League Baseball are very challenging, and you know there's a cycle that f most of the smaller market teams have to go through, and the Reds are unfortunately in that cycle right now. We want the Reds to be successful because I always believe when I was at the Bengals, and I did some partnerships Reds Bengals when I was there, that when the sports teams do well, there is a, a, a lift for everyone. Um, when the Reds were having good seasons. The, the Bengals fans could see the excitement in their coworkers or their neighbors who are Reds fans, and it made their anticipation for our season, for their sport, more palpable. Yet when the Reds were struggling and people were in the doldrums, you know, it just it, it didn't have that same bubbling 
in advance of the Bengals season. And I think the same as when the Bengals are doing well as you go into college basketball and, and the like. So we want the Reds to be successful. We did schedule 100%. Um, we sent the Reds' schedule to our league and said, please, when the Reds are home, we want to be away and vice versa. While they're scheduling 29 teams, that wasn't always possible. I get to set the times. And so if I had the same date that the Reds had, if the Reds are at 1, which they were this past weekend, we're at 4.30. If the Reds are at 7, like they were a couple weeks ago, we, we played it uh, at 4.30. You know, the Louisville, I'll just tell you this little one. The Louisville coach, he's a pistol, James O'Connor. We played them at 4.30 in July. Uh, I think it was like 20th or something. And it was 95 degrees, and probably the turf was like 105 degrees. And he complained before the game to our coach. And John says, well, well James, we're, we're both playing on it. Like, there's no advantage. Let's go. You know, and he's like, I can't believe the idiots in your front office schedule a game at, you know, 4 o'clock. And, um, and then he said it again at the press conference the next day, almost blaming the heat on why they lost. And my point was, look, when I'm scheduling in January, I don't know if we're going to draw 5,000, 10,000. I, you know, I, I think we're going to do okay, but I don't know. The last thing I want to do is go head-to-head -head with the Reds. So if the Reds are at 7, I can't be at 7. I'm going to be at 4. And that's what we did. And, uh, you know, again, both teams play at the same time. So. But he didn't like that too much. So I'm the idiot in the FC front office. <laughs> so, yeah. Sorry, could you just mention the uh, gap in the schedule you left in July for the friendly? Yes. So this was, uh, I, I'm not the smart guy here. I'm just the executor of wisdom. Mark McCullers, uh, my consultant who had been at the crew, knew that July is when international friendlies get scheduled. That's the time that they get played, I should say. And so um, because of the Copa and European championships, he knew that MLS would be shutting down during that window because they'd be losing so many players to play uh, for their countries. And so as a result, when those championships ended, those tournaments ended, MLS would be nonstop. And so there would be no open MLS weekends in July. And so he said to me, you know, the way these things normally work is they'll play a Wednesday, a Saturday, and a Wednesday. And they'll play the MLS teams on the Wednesday, but they'll have no one to play on the Saturday. And he says, if you can get the league to give us an open July, Saturday, we could probably get a pretty decent uh, squad to come in here that financially probably would help us. And so we went to the league, hey, we're a first-year team, and, you know, we don't know what we're going to get. And it'd be really great if you can give us an open July weekend. And so they gave us an open July weekend. And literally, from the moment our schedule came out, I started getting emails and calls from European and Mexican and, uh, you know, other clubs saying, hey, can we play a friendly against you guys? We're coming to the United States. You know, we're going to do the Wednesday, Wednesday MLS. We need a Saturday. And so if you think about it, you know, maybe there's an NASL team, but, you know, we're a big market. Cincinnati, so the thought was, you know, we had John Harks, John's relationships help, Mark's relationship help. He had had Crystal Palace when he was at the crew. Um, you know, we had a top Italian team contact us. We had a, other EPL teams in touch with us. So here is my point. Now I had all the leverage, and I'll just share that, you know, we got a pretty good deal because we had multiple clubs all looking for that Saturday. And uh, so, and, and then obviously our ability to make it 35,000 well, let me just say it's covering what we lost on the TV side, you know? <laughs> that was a fun game. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. So we, I mean, just a couple little things. We had a, v, we had a VIP event the night before uh, for our supporter group leaders and for our sponsors and sweet holders that the Crystal Palace came to. It was really well done. Alan Pardew said nothing had ever happened like that when they've done this previously. Um, we let them wear their home colors. We didn't have to do that. We thought it was sort of tip of the cap. And I also wanted our fans to see us in the whites for the first time uh, against, uh, against them. We played their walkout song uh, when they came out, which is what they play in, in their home venue. Again, they're the EPL. So we did all those things as respect. You know, they're supporter groups. Uh, they had people traveling in from England and from all, all over the United States who are Palace fans. And we wanted to be the destination. We were obviously a weekend, so it made it a little bit easier, and it just became a great event to the point where literally right before he filmed that video, uh, I went down, I was on the field, and, and thanked Alan, and he said, uh, we'd come every year if you'd have us. We'd come every year. Uh, and so my guess is we will have Palace back. 
I think what we'd probably think of is maybe every other year or something like that just to have some others. But, uh, you know, I think we have a special relationship. What he said on that video, comparing it to an FA Cup final, FA Cup final is like the English final. Uh, and they had lost, they lost to Man United this year uh, by a goal in added time. So, you know, they had just come from a really big environment. And for him, three months later, two months later, to compare us to that, you know, trust me, we made sure the MLS saw that. We made sure that, you know, all the soccer commentators saw that. So it, it was a wonderful night. Sure. Let me do that one first. Uh, if John, uh, look, we, we think we're going to be in the MLS. But if, John, if we win the league this year and some MLS team wants John next year, I literally, without him asking, I put it in his contract, a free transfer. And in soccer, people pay transfer fees to the manager. I, I, wanted, it, I wanted John to feel like, make us successful, and if you get an offer to move up, I'm going to let you do it. Uh, because this was such a critical year for us, and, and I never want to stand in the way. So just like you know, the Bengals, Hugh Jackson, Mike Zimmer, they're now, that's, that's respect for your organization when your guys move on and, and to the next level or to the next opportunity at, at a higher level where they can be successful. I wasn't going to stand in the way of that. I guarantee you we are a desirable organization right now. I will have no issues finding another really good coach. So the plan is for John to come back, but at the end of the year, if he gets a unique opportunity, he's free to do it. Uh, as it relates to the colors, my uh, partner in creating this, again, I'm a full-time guy at the Bengals. Uh, I had a Procter & Gamble, uh, former Procter & Gamble brand executive work with me to create this. He had literally been my predecessor as president of uh, Hammer FC. Uh, so we had sort of had that youth soccer experience, but he, he was Procter & Gamble. We in this town know the beauty and the wisdom of Procter brand people. And so he did some consumer marketing uh, research. He probably knew it off the top of his head. But orange is considered an uh, inviting, warm color. Red and yellow are considered hot colors. So some people love red, some people hate red. Same with yellow. But orange, sort of the, the merging of the two, most people like it. You may not love it, but it, it, it has this inviting quality to it. Uh, and, and I will say I, I liked orange, uh, not because of the bangles, because real to be you know, the Bengals orange is a different hue of orange. There's a lot more red in it. Um, but a, 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 a more general orange that we're using, I liked. Everyone likes blue, so then it was sort of a sh what shade of blue. And uh, so we did two things. One is we looked at the merchandise sales of orange and blue teams. Clemson, Syracuse, Florida Gators, Denver Broncos. And what you saw is from a merchandise standpoint, that was a winning proposition. Those teams sell lots of merchandise. Uh, the other part is we looked at MLS and USL to see if other teams had that combination, and they did not. Uh, and so we knew that those were, uh, that was a color uh, pattern that had some staying power, both from a brand merchandise point of view as well as where we want to take the club. Uh, the last thing, and you didn't ask, but some people ask, and I'm probably wrapping up on time, is our, our marks. So uh, the lion, I think some might call it a griffin, uh, but it is the lion of St. Mark the Evangelist. Uh, so soccer fans, we're all in this together. We want to be evangelists for our sport. And because of the civic nature of this, we want to be evangelists for our city. Uh, and we want FC to be a part of the evangelism of Cincinnati. And so that's how we came up with the lion of St. Mark the Evangelist. We put wings on it representing speed, speed of play. The sword obviously representing sort of a fierceness. Uh, there's a soccer ball in the lion's hand if you sort of look into the logo a little and then the crown represents you know we're the queen city and so that's how we came up with uh the marks uh and um you know we didn't uh, i'll just share with you most teams in our league like at the top level are selling about two hundred thousand dollars in merchandise we thought we would sell six hundred thousand in merchandise and the league said you're crazy and i said no if we do this thing the right way we think we have attractive colors we think you know, our marks are pretty attractive. Uh, we, we think we could do all right. Uh, and at the end of the season, we'll have end up doubling that. Our, among the biggest challenges this year has been merchandise. 
a problem of success. How do we make these lines go faster on game day? We're in a vending area down on 4th Street. Our office is on the third floor, but we have a little vending area. Literally, it's where the Coke machine was, and that's our store. We're going to be expanding uh, here in the next six months. Uh, but, you know, our, uh, I adjusted the budget given that we're doing successful. So now the merchandise, uh, director of merchandise and retail, 17 years at Ralph Lauren. I mean, he knows what he's doing, you know. <laughs> Before, literally, literally, although my kids enjoyed it, we'd bring in samples and show my kids and my wife and the other female executives, is this good kids stuff? Is this good, you know, uh, women's wear? Because before I had, you know, a bunch of guys saying, oh yeah, this is, and, and then it wasn't selling and it's like, well, maybe I'm asking the wrong people. <laughs> But now Amir uh, Shimoni has come from Ralph Lauren. He was in China for the last six years. Is where we're going on merchandise is just amazing. Yeah. Did you make a conscious effort to get football club instead of soccer club? You know, uh, that's a good question. The question was football club versus soccer club. You know, uh, in soccer, the way I viewed it is, you see more of the FC than you see the SC. FC Dallas, FC Barcelona, you just, it, it's a more common way to speak to your club identity. Now, I will share this. Um, you know, right now we are football, F-U-T-B-O-L, more the Spanish. And we've had some people suggest we should be more foosball, which is more German in the German heritage of Cincinnati, uh, and with Over the Rhine, and we're the second biggest Oktoberfest. And so I, I, will, I will share that that is under advisement. <laughs> hey, on the back. Can you give me a streetcar ride up to the stadium? <laughs> uh, well, um, so truth be told, I mentioned I was on city council, and this is a controversial issue, but I will say I've, I was the deciding vote in favor of the streetcar. Because um, there, 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 were, there were four uh, known opponents uh, and uh, um, there were sort of uh, four people that were, I'm sorry, there were three known opponents, four people that were going to be supportive. Chris Bortz, who was certainly going to be supportive, had to recuse himself. And so literally it was going to be, all right, well, where's Bertie? And I was sort of known as a fiscally conservative, how are we going to pay for this, that kind of stuff. Um, but I did believe in the vision. One of the things I do believe, right or wrong, is Part of government should be big projects, big ideas, big ambition. Um, and I thought the streetcar represented that kind of vision for our city. Now, I will be fair, at the time, it did go all the way up the hill. And then the governor's uh, office changed, and Governor Kasich took the money from the streetcar to take it up the hill and put it into the Martin Luther King Interchange at 71, which is also a good transportation initiative. But at some point, I would predict it will get up the hill, and you'd be able to go from the over the Rhine bars up onto campus and up around the hospitals. I think ultimately that happens. My concern, and I said this at the time when I was on council, not to get into politics, but phase one has to be successful. If phase one is not successful, it'll be hard to make the case to the public, we now need to go phase two. It's hard to say, well, phase one isn't successful because there's no phase two and then convince people, so we're supposed to put more money into this when you're, you're admitting phase one doesn't work. And so I think in my mind, there was some question, should the route be amended when the money got pulled to take it up the hill and maybe it become a little bit more of a, a, a northeast, or I'm sorry, a east-west mover, you know, Proctor, uh, the casino, Sawyer Point, the banks, the convention center, the hotels, you know, more of this than that, just because my concern was how many people are going to ride it? But we are where we are now, and our all, I think all of our hope, whether you initially were for it or not, is we want our city to be successful, and hopefully it works. I, I will share with you that when we're talking to the MLS, we have streetcar in our presentation because it's a sign of urban uh, investment, of urban growth, of, of modernity uh, in terms of, you know, when you think of Europe and, and, and soccer and the rest of the world, they have transportation systems. The MLS looks at that. Uh, and so I'm proud of my vote, and I want it to work. And uh, you know, let's uh, keep our fingers crossed, and then keep working to get it up the hill. So I'm probably out of time. So uh, again, I thank everyone for your interest. I wish you all well. Uh, hopefully, you're doing business or soon to be doing business with Gaslight. Do a little commercial there for you. Uh, hopefully, everyone's been to a game.
Thank you.